Hello, so today will be the last lecture or the denouma of this course on Fourier analysis and applications. Last time we discussed the continuity or the differentiation operator with respect to the weak star topology on the space of Schwarz distribution. Here continuity refers to sequential continuity. Today we begin by proving the corresponding result for the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform maps S prime R to S prime R. This Fourier transform as an operator will be sequentially continuous with respect to the weak convergence of distribution or the weak star topology as it were. So theorem 123 that you see displayed in the slide. Suppose u n is a sequence of tempered distributions converging weakly to u. Then the corresponding sequence u n hat converges weakly to u hat. So take an element g which is rapidly decreasing that is in the Schwarz class and let us compute u n hat paired with g. Or the definition of Fourier transform of a tempered distribution simply put the hat on the other factor says so un paired with g hat but un converges to u weakly so un paired with g hat converges to u paired with g hat that's what you see a red arrow and then put the hat back to where it belongs namely u hat paired with g and that completes the proof of the theorem. The proof is exactly similar to the earlier proof of the continuity of the differentiation operator. A simple exercise, find the weak limit of root pi by root epsilon e to the power minus x squared by 4 epsilon. Either you can use a definition of weak limit or you can recognize this as a Fourier transform of e to the power minus epsilon x squared e to the power minus epsilon x squared converges weakly to 1. So by the continuity of the Fourier transform by theorem 123, the corresponding Fourier transforms will converge to the Fourier transform of 1 that is 2 pi times the Dirac delta. So I've given you the exercise and I've given you two different ways to proceed. Some more exercises, consider the distribution u equal to exponential of i a x squared where a is a real number. Now because a is a real number, u is actually an L infinity function so it's a tempered distribution. Now what I do is that I change it. I change a to a plus i epsilon. I change a to a plus i epsilon. Prove that u epsilon converges to u in the weak sense of distribution. Now take epsilon bigger than 0 and you just proceed in the usual way. So if you replace a by a plus i epsilon, what happens to the exponential? The exponential becomes e to the power i a x squared and there is a minus epsilon x squared. Because of the presence of the minus epsilon x squared, suddenly the function has become from L infinity, it has suddenly landed up in the Schwarz space S of R. It is rapidly decreasing, so we can com compute the Fourier transform by using the integral formula. Proceed along the usual lines, how you compute the Fourier transform in chapter 4 and put the definition, complete the square and you land up in the integral that is displayed in the slide. Integral over R, there is a factor in front of the integral exponential of minus lambda times x plus i chi by 2 lambda the whole squared where lambda simply denotes epsilon plus i a just for simplicity I use a notation lambda. Now you want to reduce this integral to integral of e to the power minus t squared dt. How will you transform this to an integral e to the power minus t squared dt? You must go back to chapter 1, see how we computed the Fourier transform of the Gaussian by using Cauchy's theorem, right? We shifted the contour of integration using Cauchy's theorem. You imitate that idea and you complete this problem. For a slightly different approach, you can look at the book of Strichart's, page 47. And that completes this exercise. There are many other exercises and here I am going to take a couple from Strichartz's book and this is a very nice exercise that you see on page 50. Before we take it up, we must know what are radial functions and radial distributions. In chapter 4 towards the very end, we talked about 
functions which are radial and we proved that the Fourier transform is also radial but this was in the context of the Schwarz space. Now we want to do the same thing for a distribution. Uh, when will a distribution be radial? Okay, before that what is the radial function? A function phi is said to be a radial function if phi composed with r is phi where r is a rotation matrix. For example, e to the power minus mod x squared is a radial function. So anything which depends only on mod x is a radial function. There is a way to describe uh, which tempered distributions are radial. There is a way to compose a distribution with a diffeomorphism. We don't need this general result and that is discussed in chapter 6 of Hormander's book. The chapter says composition with smooth maps. But the rule that we will apply it will be to distributions which are actually functions. So we are going to be looking at functions which are locally integrable etc. And those are going to depend only on the mod x in R3. Our examples are going to be in R3. And the, in fact, the examples are going to be specific. We are going to be looking at the distributions mod x to the power minus 1 and mod x to the power minus 2. They are locally integrable functions and they decay as x goes to infinity. So they both define tempered distributions in R3. And what radial means is very clear here. And so we will not elaborate on this concept anymore. Just that these are radial functions and the Fourier transform of one of them is going to be the other one with a constant factor thrown in. So let's get to the example itself. So that's theorem 124. The locally integrable functions 1 upon mod x and 4 pi by mod x squared both define tempered distributions on R3. How do you make them as tempered distributions? You are going to tell me what does it do to a function g in the Schwarz class. This g comes from the Schwarz class. g maps to integral gx dx upon mod x to the power k. Remember, I will write x, dx in polar coordinates and so k is either 1 or 2 and I will get r squared sin phi dr d theta d phi. Remember that r squared will cancel with the mod x to the power k where k is 1 or 2. And then you will be left with simply integral of gx times either r or nothing and gx is a rapidly decreasing function so there is no problem as far as the convergence of this integral is concerned. And you can see that 10.21 does make 1 upon mod x and 4 pi by mod x squared into tempered distributions. If you want, you can directly prove that they are continuous. If gn converges to g in the Schwarz class, the corresponding integrals converge. First part is very clear. Now we turn to the second part of the theorem, how to find the Fourier transform of 1 upon mod x. The Fourier transform computation is a very different matter. Call this distribution 1 upon mod x as u and we proceed as usual. So what is the definition of Fourier transform? You see the last display. u hat paired with g is simply u paired with g hat. The hat goes on the other side. And so now we use the definition of Fourier transform of a rapidly decreasing function as an integral. So right hand side basically becomes integral g hat dx upon mod x. We use the def definition 10.21 and the definition of the Fourier transform both. And the left hand side u hat paired with g is simply this. Okay, now what we are going to do is that we are going to put the definition of g hat and that's one more integration e to the power minus i x dot y g y dy. Of course, the next step is pretty obvious. We are going to switch the order of integrations. We are going to switch, we are going to integrate with respect to x first. Let's try to do that and let us see what happens. The inner integral is e to the power minus i x dot y dx upon mod x. I'm going to put x equal to a z and the a will be thrown to the other factor. It will become a transpose y. And I'm going to select the rotation matrix a in such a way that a transpose y is simply aligned in the e3 direction. Again, you must go back to chapter 4 when we proved that a Fourier transform of a radial function is another radial function. And you see the same technique was used there. And so I will leave that 
for you to uh, verify and I can choose this A in such a way that you'll get mod Y times E3 and this becomes Z and Z can be written in terms of polar coordinates and you get an integral e to the power minus rho mod by cos phi. Remember there is a rho squared sine phi. One rho cancelled because the denominator you had a rho. Remember mod x will be the same as mod z because A is an orthogonal matrix and mod z is rho and so one rho get cancels and you left with rho d rho and the radial coordinate goes from 0 to infinity and there are two angular coordinates theta and phi, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi and that's why I picked up a 2 pi here and the phi variable goes from 0 to pi e to the power minus i rho mod y cos phi sin phi d phi. How convenient put cos phi equal to t so sin phi d phi will be minus dt and the limits of integration will become minus 1 and 1 and you can actually perform this integral e to the power minus rho mod y t perform that integration and so one more integral has been dealt with only the integral with respect to rho remains and what you see you see trouble in front of you you see integral 0 to infinity sin mod y rho d rho that's an oscillatory integral and you need to deal with oscillatory integral by now you have got sufficient experience in dealing with oscillatory integrals Whenever you deal with an oscillatory integral, what comes to your mind is the x of minus epsilon mod x squared trick. Of course, you will try to throw in a e to the power minus epsilon mod x squared and take the limit as epsilon goes to 0. We have seen this several times in the past, so no need to dwell on this. But if you put in this e to the power minus epsilon mod x squared, you will run into a messy integral. You may be able to come out of it, but it will give you some little bit of trouble. But there is no need to choose e to the power minus epsilon mod x squared. Some other modification of this trick will also be sufficient for our purpose. So instead of using a e to the power minus epsilon mod x squared trick, you use e to the power minus epsilon mod x instead. And the same logic will go through. But this time you will get an integral that you can quickly evaluate. Namely the inner integral becomes e to the power minus epsilon rho sin mod y rho d rho. Now we must go back and consult tables of Laplace transforms that you taught your undergraduate students. The Laplace transform of sine and the Laplace transform of cosine. So what you see the inner integral is the Laplace transform of sine. Or go ahead and integrate it using integration by parts twice, whichever method suits you. But I'm going to make my life easy simply by recalling the formula for Laplace transform of sine. You're going to get a mod y by mod y squared plus epsilon squared. And one mod y cancelled off. You simply left with integral over R3 gy dy upon mod y squared plus epsilon squared. Well, now we need to take the limit inside the integral, the dominated convergence theorem will immediately come to your rescue. Remember that we are in R3, when you write polar coordinates in R3, it is R squared dr d theta d phi sine phi and there is a R squared below and an R squared above. So the fact that there is a mod y squared below is going to give you no difficulty whatsoever. You can use a DCT and you will get the result. It is basically this epsilon will go away and you get integral g y dy by mod y squared which is exactly 1 upon mod y squared paired with g. There is a 4 pi factor of course which always remains and we have established the theorem. <clears throat> and so I explained to you how to prove the last equality. It's an application of the dominated convergence theorem. Now let us discuss Fourier series again from the point of view of distribution theory. So we are in the very first chapter we talked about pointwise convergence, in the second chapter we talked about L2 convergence, in the third chapter we talked about Cesaro convergence, in the final chapter we talk about distributional convergence of Fourier series. So four different modes of convergence we are discussing. And the weakest one and the most useful one is here. So let us go back to one of those examples from chapter one, the Fourier expansion of mod x and that is displayed here in the slide. 
Now, because the presence of 2k minus 1, the whole squared in the denominator, the series converges uniformly to mod x, the 2 pi periodic extension of mod x. And uniform convergence of a periodic function will imply weak convergence in the sense of distributions. And in other words, the partial sums s and fx converges uniformly to mod x and so it will also converge in the sense of distributions. So why are we weakening it? Why are we doing this? Why are we getting rid of uniform convergence and harping on weak star convergence? Because differentiation is continuous. If I know that if a sequence of distributions converges weakly, the derivatives will also converge weakly. So I can differentiate s n once, twice, etc. So let me differentiate Sn once. The sequence of derivatives will converge weakly. When I differentiate what happens, the cosine becomes a sine and the minus sine goes away. 1, 2k minus 1 goes away and I get the next one. So from the right hand side, I get 4 times summation k from 1 to infinity sine 2k minus 1x upon 2k minus 1. So the left hand side, when you differentiate mod x, you get the signum function. Remember that we are looking not at the mod x on the entire real line. If you take the mod x on the entire real line, then the derivative is a signum function. But you are looking at the mod x which has been periodically extended beyond minus pi pi. So you are going to get a periodized version of the signum function. What is it? The signum function of x is 1 on the interval 0 to pi it is minus 1 on the interval minus pi to 0, extend this as a 2 pi periodic function and you get this result. This falls under the purview of Dirichlet's theorem that we discussed in the last chapter. Namely, this converges pointwise except at the discontinuities and at points of discontinuity it converges to 0. We have seen this in the last lecture. But now I want to differentiate it once again. When I differentiate the signum function, I get the Dirac delta. In fact, I get the twice the Dirac delta and I'll get a twice the Dirac delta placed at 0, pi, minus pi, etc. So I'm going to differentiate this term by term. Now once I differentiate it term by term, I go outside the realm of classical analysis and I must resort to distributions. The series of derivatives will no longer converge pointwise, it will converge in the sense of distributions. So what happens, the sequence of derivatives, the one up, the 2k minus 1 which was the denominator that goes away, you simply got summation k from 1 to infinity cosine 2k minus 1x. And when I differentiate the signum function, I get the Dirac delta. But here I get a minus 1 to the power n and I want you to tell me why is this minus 1 to the power n appearing? You should draw the graph of the signum function and you should understand what happens when I go from pi to 2 pi and from 2 pi to 3 pi in which way the graph ascends and descends. Accordingly, the derivative will pick up a plus sign or a minus sign and at the, because of discontinuity, you are going to pick up a Dirac delta. So I leave the amusing details for you and we get 10.22. 10.22 has to be understood in the sense of distributions. Summation n from minus infinity to infinity minus 1 to the power n times the Dirac mass placed at pi n. The sum of Dirac deltas left hand side is obviously a distribution and the right hand side is an infinite series that doesn't converge in the classical sense but it converges weakly in the sense of distributions. Now I take the Fourier transform of both sides of 10.22. Both sides are distributions and both sides converge weakly in the sense of distribution. That is the partial sums of the two series on either side converge in the sense of distributions. The Fourier transform is a continuous operator in the sense of distributions and so I can take term by term Fourier transform of both sides. So, Calculate the Fourier transform of delta pi n. Remember, this is not the Dirac delta at the origin, this is the Dirac delta at pi n. So go back and put the definition of the Dirac delta and put the definition of the Fourier transform and evaluate the Fourier transform of both sides term by term and look at the equation that you get. The resulting equation will be the 
Jacobi theta function identity in disguise. Let us now do another exercise. Instead of taking the Fourier transform of both sides, let us directly pair both sides with a Schwarz function gx. Which Schwarz function gx am I going to choose? No prizes for guessing. I am going to choose my gx to be e to the power minus tx square t real positive. And so what happens to the left hand side? It is gx paired with delta pi n. What am I going to get? I am going to get g of pi n. What about the right hand side? Cos 2k minus 1x paired with gx is simply integral gx cos 2k minus 1x dx. So what do I get? That's exactly what I got on the right hand side. Integral from minus infinity to infinity e to the power minus tx squared cos 2k minus 1x dx. Left hand side is summation minus infinity to infinity minus 1 to the power n e to the power minus t pi squared n squared. The g evaluated at pi n. Now let us combine this, let us simplify the left hand side as pi times 1 plus 2 times summation n from 1 to infinity minus 1 to the power n e to the power minus pi squared n squared t. And the 2 factor was taken on the right hand side. So 2 cosine a is e to the power i a plus e to the power minus i a. So each of these two pieces is the Fourier transform of a Gaussian. You know how to calculate the Fourier transform of a Gaussian, it's another Gaussian. And the result is displayed over here, the last line. Let us go a step further. So I'm going to take the last equation and I'm going to replace t by 1 upon 4 pi squared tau in the previous equation and just do a simple algebra here, 10.23. What you're going to get is when you replace t by 1 upon 4 pi square t, that's a routine algebra, you're going to get equation 10.23, 1 upon 2 root pi tau times 1 plus twice summation n from 1 to infinity minus 1 to the power n e to the power minus n squared upon 4 tau equals summation k from minus infinity to infinity e to the power minus pi squared 2k minus 1 the whole square tau, equation 10.23. Now go back to chapter 1, go back to chapter 1 and recall the formula for the Jacobi theta function identity, that transformation formula that was equation 1.25 and I repeated it here for your convenience and I want to compare 10.23 and 1.25. Before comparing, I am going to put t equal to pi. When I put t equal to pi, cos nt is minus 1 to the power n and you see we get the left hand side of 10.23. On the right hand side, I put, when I put t equal to pi, I get exactly the right hand side of 10.23. So you see that the equation that we got 10.22 is exactly the Jacobi theta function identity in disguise. So now we want to look at this in a slightly different modern perspective. The equation 10.22 that we got, the left hand side was a bunch of Dirac deltas, right? Here I can split this sum into two sums, those with odd ends and those with even ends. So let's do that. Let's separate out the, the two and we get each of those two pieces is a sum of the form 10.24. It is an infinite series of Dirac deltas placed at mc where m varies over the integer. That's a, it's an integer lattice. The set of all mc's forms a cyclic subgroup of R and the series 10.24 converges weekly and the sum is a tempered distribution. Now we want to study this tempered distribution closely. I'm going to omit some of the routine computational details. So I'm going to take the Fourier transform of both sides as before. So u hat will be take the term by term Fourier transform. That Fourier transform of the Dirac delta is basically e to the power minus i y m c. And I'm going to combine the exponentials with opposite signs as 2 cosine mcy. Now what I want to do is that this summation here converges in the sense of distributions. And this is the second derivative of something. It's a second derivative of what? Look at 10.26. So 
Look at the series on 10.2. So the series on the right hand side of 10.26 is a uniformly convergent series and the sum is a nice function f of y. When you differentiate the series 10.26 twice in the sense of distributions mind you, I get 10.25. So 10.25 has been written as 1 plus f double prime y. It will be very nice if I can find a better formula for f of y. If I can sum this series on the right hand side, then it will be nice. That's what we'll do. Now what you do is you start with a sawtooth function. The sawtooth function is s of x equal to x on 0 to 2 pi. Extend this function as a 2 pi periodic function and you get a sawtooth function and you can write its Fourier series. Take that Fourier series and do a term by term integration. Take the Fourier series and do a term by term integration and what you will get will be pi squared by 3 minus twice summation m from 1 to infinity cos mx upon m squared. So in some sense the summation cos mx upon m squared I have an expression for that. Namely I just have to take the sawtooth function and integrate it. And I need to replace x by cx. So that I get cos mcx upon m squared. And so I can calculate explicitly what this f of y is going to be and that f of y has been displayed over here minus pi squared upon 3 c squared plus pi times mod y by c minus y squared upon 2 in this interval. Now the first term is a constant and, and the last term is an even function and the, and the middle term is also an even function. So you're going to extend it as an even function as a 2 pi periodic even function with period 2 pi by c. The period is now 2 pi by c because I scaled the variables. I want to take the second derivative, remember? But I have to take the second derivative in the sense of distributions. The constant term will disappear. When I take the distributional derivative of minus y squared by 2, I am going to pick a minus 1. What is the distributional derivative of mod y? It is the Dirac delta and it will be weighted by 2, twice the Dirac delta. So you get 2 pi by c into the Dirac delta at the origin. If I get the Dirac delta at the origin, I am going to get a Dirac delta at 2 pi by c, 4 pi by c, etc. because it is a periodic function. f of y is a periodic function with period 2 pi by c. So I get the whole bunch of Dirac deltas equation 10.27. So f double prime has been computed. Put this value f double prime in the previous equation 10.24. The 1 goes away, I cancels with this minus 1 and you are left with this beautiful result theorem 125. This theorem 125 is called the Poisson summation formula. For c not equal to 0, you take a lattice of Dirac deltas concentrated at the points m, c. The Fourier transform is another lattice of Dirac deltas concentrated at 2 pi m by c with a factor of 2 pi by c thrown in front of it. Now let us evaluate both sides at a function in the Schwarz class. So if I take a phi in the Schwarz class and apply both sides of 10.28 to phi, left hand side becomes summation phi of mc, right hand side becomes summation phi hat of 2 pi m by c with a factor of 2 pi by c in front of it. In chapter 1, the relevant phi was the Gaussian and we got the Poisson summation formula for a special case in chapter 1. This is the general theorem, the most general Poisson summation formula. Now what happens if this is in one variable? What about several variables? What happens if I take Rn and take a lattice of Dirac deltas in Rn? The formula becomes even more interesting in several variables. The Poisson summation formula assumes a much more interesting aspect in several variables. The book of Strichart's page 120 contains a beautiful discussion on lattices and dual lattices. You think of a lattice of Dirac deltas as a crystal structure and the Fourier transform corresponds to the X-ray diffraction pattern that emerges out. And experiments have shown that bright spots appear at points of the dual lattice. So this physical experiment with crystals and X-ray diffraction patterns arising from crystals has a beautiful mathematical description, namely the Poisson summation formula. 
the student can scarcely do better than undertake a systematic study of Strichartz's book. After this course, the best thing to do would be to take up Strichartz's book and look at those topics that we could not touch upon in this course. Here is a list of topics. The Bochner's theorem on positive definite functions. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics, the Paley-Wiener theorems, and a glimpse into a beautiful area of analysis called microlocal analysis, wavelets and the Haar systems, and how that gives rise to Vieta's formulas, beautiful formulas in classical analysis, and a glimpse into pseudo differential operators. And I wish you good luck with your studies of stretch charts and beyond. And this is the end of this course. Thank you very much.